Good morning. Uh, good morning to the regular session of the Yuma County Board of Supervisors. We will also be sitting at all special taxing districts, and this is the July 6, 2022, <coughs> 9 a.m. meeting. Uh, this meeting is being held on a Wednesday because Monday was a holiday, Tuesday, and we normally move the Mondays that are holidays into the Wednesdays of that same week. Um, you know, all board members are present. Uh, they can either attend in person by telephone or remotely via electronic conferencing. Um, and this is the call to order. Uh, the first item in the agenda would be a pledge of allegiance. And would everybody please stand up and Supervisor. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I think. I think Mr. Lyons enjoy the fact that, uh, you know, I always start off with the pledge and, you know, trying to forget his last name, but it's almost impossible now. It's been too long. So anyway, um, the first item in the agenda is called to the public and call to the public is held for the public's benefit. To allow individuals to address issues within the board's jurisdiction, board members may not, dis may not discuss items that are not specifically identified in the agenda. Therefore, pursuant to revised statutes, to Arizona revised statutes, Action taken as a result of public comment will be limited to directing staff to study the matter, responding to criticism, or scheduling the matter for further discussion and a decision at a future date. Could public comment may be made in person or submitted by email at publiccomment at yumacountyaz.gov. The email forms of public comment will be accepted until 8 a.m. on the morning of the meeting. Our public comments will be read aloud during the Yuma County Board of Supervisors meeting that starts at 9 a.m. Desiree, do we have any email comments? Okay, thank you. Uh, I do have, I think, one speaker um, card. Uh, it's from Gail Castro Castricone. Castricone. I, I, you know, I, 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 I pronounce it so many times that I should know it by now. And you, she wants to talk a little bit about the Avenue BNC Colonia, uh, I would call, situation. Okay, thank you so much for your time. Good morning. I'm Gail Castricone. I reside at 3788 West 18th Place. I'm an advocate for the Avenue BNC Colonia. I want to address 19 reasons that I show up to the County Board of Supervisors meeting twice a month. The 19 reasons are my daughter, Laura, who now owns our Fifth Street family home, my deceased son, Kenny, who is my inspiration for never giving up, and my youngest daughter, Diana, who always has a good attitude and a smile on her face, my 11 grandchildren who have grown up to be phenomenal adults and my five little great-grandchildren. The BNC Colonia is where my husband and I raised our family since 1979. It was a rough neighborhood, but as a young family, and my husband just out of the military and a cadet firefighter, we didn't have much money to buy our first home. We always invested everything we had fixing up our home for our precious family. Through blood, sweat, and tears, we redid the whole house and yard. It took over 20 years to do that. Our children had farm animals and plenty of land to play in, which was a good thing because the neighborhood was not safe. I was a Head Start teacher for 10 years, and many of my precious students and their families lived in the BNC Colonia, some living in substandard housing. Now that I am turning 70, the top priority on my bucket list is the restoration of the BNC Colonia. At our monthly meeting last night, we had a very good dialogue with your staff, George Amara and uh, Carlos Gonzalez about code violations in the band trailer park. Things um, appear to be moving forward in our neighborhood. Supervisor Pancrazzi stepped up to the plate with enthusiasm about restoring the BNC. We will continue on with our Avenue BNC Butterfly projects to restore law and order in our community. For years, every time I walk my dogs, I always carry a trash bag. I picked up beer bottles and cans, scattered trash and pulled weeds along the side of the roads and houses. Last week, I found a used condom in plain sight for everyone to see. I bet you think I'm talking about the Colonia B and C, but I am not. I am talking about Falls Ranch where Supervisor Pancrazzi and I live. I encourage every neighborhood to be proactive and vigilant about code violations and knowing their neighbors. Rentals are one of our biggest challenges in most neighborhoods throughout Yuma. Even the Colonia was beautiful at one time until years and years of neglect turned into slum and blight in our neighborhood. I'll leave you with this quote, only love and light can drive out darkness. 
God bless you. Thank you for your time. And God bless America. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Gail. All right. Anybody else in call to the public? I am going to leave these, uh, this particular um, item in the agenda open during the, um, during the meeting so that we can come back in case someone you know, kind of shows up a little late or needs to address the board. Um, and I'm moving on then in the agenda to the presentations, oh. proclamations, and appointments. Uh, during this segment of, the, segment of the agenda, board members may discuss their presentations and proclamations and may announce appointments to the Yuma County Planning and Zoning Commission, the Yuma County Board of Adjustments. No, no legal actions will be taken. And uh, the first item that we have is a presentation to recognize Joe Rafa Lopez with the Life Saving Award. Morning, Chairman, members of the board. Um, honored to have these gentlemen with me today. I have a little story to tell. On May 10th, 2022, Public Works Equipment Operator Juan Salcedo and Public Works Senior Equipment Operator Joe Rafa Lopez were on break eating lunch at a job site located near Avenue 15E and South Frontage Road. While Juan was eating, a portion of food got lodged inside his throat. His airway was obstructed and he began choking. Juan attempted to wash the food down with water, which actually caused more of an obstruction in his airway. And at that moment, Juan realized he could no longer breathe. Juan feared for his life and signaled to Joe Rafa Lopez for help because he was desperate for air. Without hesitation, Mr. Lopez responded and immediately began rendering aid to Juan. Mr. Lopez remembered his prior CPR first aid training and performed the Heimlich maneuver on Juan in an attempt to clear his airway. Due to Mr. Lopez's quick response and effective first aid, Juan's obstruction was cleared and the food was dislodged from his throat. When interviewed, Juan Salcido stated he was lucky and thankful that Joe Lopez was present that day because, quote, he saved my life. So on this day, on behalf of Yuma County government, we are honored to recognize Joe Rafa Lopez for his selfless and courageous act of rendering first aid in a sudden and unexpected situation, which resulted in the preservation of human life. It is my honor to present the life saving award to Joe Rafa Lopez. Look at this. And a certificate saving award. Thank you. So please, if any of you gentlemen would like to say a few words, you're more than welcome to, and we'll thank or curse or say what the board wants. Well, you put these on the paper. I'm just grateful that he was there and knew what to do right away. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I'm just going to say thank you to Yuma County because they gave me that, that instruction when I, I begin to work with them. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you so much. And before you guys go, we'll do a, a photo. I'm Lynn. Hi. Oh, yeah. I love the haircut. Yeah. We've already hugged. Yeah. Right to center, guys. Oh, yeah. yeah, you guys get me. Yeah. Sure. Uh, there we go. There's a nervous moment when I had supervisor. Oh, no. There's a wallet right there. Thank you, guys. Thank Again, you. congratulations. Increase Thanks, board. guys. Do we? Can you switch sides of your wallet? I know, but no, you know. I think Lynn, Lynn is not really that. Uh, I've gotten a couple of wallets off of him. And no, no. <laughs> Just dust, huh? This is the wallet. This is sentimental value, right? Well, that takes care of presentation number one. Presentation number two is the Yuma County line by Yuma 77, the Yuma County government channel. And that's... 
Our voter and election services are ready for the primary elections as early voting begins. And we'll introduce you to Yuma County's new county administrator. These stories and more, this is your County Line. The primary election is approaching and Yuma County has finalized preparations for the August 2nd primary as early voting begins July 6th. Yuma County Election Services recently conducted two logic and accuracy tests to ensure that votes cast in the upcoming primary election are correctly counted by the tabulation equipment. Before and after every election, these tests are required. With these tests complete, our voter and election services are now ready for early voting. Early ballots are a great option or early voting in person if you don't want to worry about waiting in lines at the vote center on election day. Um, what's nice here is that the state of Arizona gives you multiple options so you can vote early in person at our offices or you can receive your ballot at home and return those to us by 7 p.m. on election night. Early voting in person will be available at the recorder's office Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. beginning Wednesday, July 6th and ending Friday, July 29th. If you're a registered voter and want to cast your ballot using an early ballot, just visit the county's website at yumacountyaz.gov. The Yuma County Board of Supervisors has unanimously appointed a new administrator for Yuma County. Ian McGahey was promoted from his position as Deputy County Administrator following a nationwide search for a replacement. Mr. McGahey has over 30 years of experience in the private and public sectors, including more than 17 years as an elected official, department director, city administrator, town manager, and Deputy County Administrator. From my first day as Deputy County Administrator two years ago, I was so impressed by the quality of the employees that work for the county. So now in my new position as county administrator, I'm really looking forward to continuing to work with the team in the service of our residents, businesses, and visitors. He holds a Master's of Public Administration and is a member of the International City-County Management Association. The county administrator directs 19 department and division directors and is responsible for the day-to-day -day operation of county activities while carrying out the Board of Supervisors direction. Hi, I'm Mary and this is your Health Watch. Without question, the COVID-19 crisis that plagued the world had everyone on edge. It put an enormous amount of stress into everyone's lives. It created a heavy burden for our healthcare experts. During the entire time, our community reached out heavily to the healthcare worker community. Yuma County is located in the southwest corner of Arizona. We have a shared border with Mexico to the south. One of the challenges that we faced early on in the pandemic was the fact that we had people going back and forth through the border every day to come to work. When we all started this, we had no vaccine. We are next to the border. Uh, there's always a concern that we have some way to mitigate the rate of infection, but there's a lot of people that cross, essential workers that cross and actually work here, but they also purchase here, and they also have family here. And we depend on these people to cross every day. So it was a challenge. I've been the mayor for some reason for almost 10 years now, but also a provider. Having that dual position puts me in a position where I can make a difference not only when treating my patients, but also making sure they don't get sick. COVID was happening so fast, so quickly, that nobody knew anything. It was just a scary moment where everybody were told to go and shelter in place. 
and our population couldn't do that because they're essential workers. They had to be working. We really wanted to partner with people that had established roots and had those relationships in the community. As healthcare providers in the public health authority, we had those relationships, but COVID came at a time where there was lots of distrust in the government. We learned early on in order to address some of this was that we really had to reach out to the local communities and especially our nonprofit partners, our elected officials, and work together with them. Some of the challenges that we saw immediately once the pandemic started is accessibility and education. Our elder population did not have access to internet or it was difficult for them to get through a phone call to make an appointment. So that's when we immediately acted as a community-based organization and we came and communicated with the Yuma County Health Department where we established this partnership where we started holding vaccination clinics here at a local community. We had decided to maintain ourselves really a community grassroots organization and being able to meet the needs of that population that very often is not known by the organizations or the governmental entities that develop the programs. Usually our population is not the one they have in focus when they're developing the, the services. We try to not just provide the services, but also be like a voice, an advocate organization that leaves their voices to those that need to hear them. It was really challenging for us to make sure that not only were we able to provide accurate information, but that it was timely and that it was presented in a manner that was culturally appropriate. And because we share that border, it also entailed having partnerships with our health officials across the border, which is the Secretaria de Salud, so that we were presenting information along the border region that was consistent, that was accurate, and that was relatable to them. So that's when we began reaching out to, to our local public health entities and they were readily available and, and, and willing to help us. Our local organizations and nonprofits have been the right match for the health department and COVID response. They've been supportive on making sure that there's one concise message to go out into the community. I feel like the health department became mobile so that we can address the immediate needs instead of waiting for the community to come to us, we went to them. Our paramedic students, our law enforcement students helped direct traffic, our social work students helped translate. So it was a true effort and it gave those students an opportunity to get some hands-on learning and hopefully will be a very unique experience. I think this is an example of how Yuma County Health Department is so essential. While everyone else is making it political, we were not making it political. It was about our residents, about keeping everyone healthy. It's about keeping the numbers down in the hospital. It's about having the proper number of ventilators available at all times. The Yuma County as a whole, I think we did very good. I'm just very proud of our community. While the Kresge Foundation has honored Yuma County Public Health for the Herculean effort put forward, it is clearly a nod to every healthcare organization here in the Southwest, highlighting how we all set the standard during this terrible time in our history. We would like to recognize an employee whose heroic actions have earned him the life-saving award from Yuma County. On May 10th, Juan Salcedo and Joe Lopez were on lunch break when suddenly Juan began choking and felt that food became lodged in his throat, obstructing his airway. Juan stated he was afraid for his life and signaled for help as he was desperate for air. Due to Joe Lopez's quick response to action and effective first aid, Juan's airway was cleared and the food had dislodged from his throat. Juan stated he was lucky and thankful that Joe was present that day because he saved his life. We would like to thank Joe Lopez for his quick and courageous act. Before we head out, we'd like to remind you about cooling centers that are now open around Yuma County. Yuma County Public Health Services District and local organizations have joined forces to open cooling centers in Yuma County. Both the Foothills and Welton Libraries have recently been added to the list of cooling stations. These centers provide free water and cool areas for our community. Visit our website at yumacountyaz.gov if you're looking for a convenient location to cool off. Thank you for joining us for this County Line. We'd like to know of any story ideas you may have, so let us know. And if you're looking for stories we've covered in the past, log on to our website at yumacountyaz.gov forward slash VOD. We'll see you on the next County Line.
All right. Well, thank you. A couple of things, a couple of observations. One, this thing was supposed to be translated into Spanish. It was just the words in English, uh, which was weird. And second, in some places, it wasn't even, the words weren't even on the bottom. So Kevin, uh, you know, take a look at that. The idea was to translate what was being said into Spanish on the bottom. It just wasn't happening. Um, and uh, I guess you've got a pretty good view of what basically goes on, but it's just a very basic update. It's, uh, I mean, county government is really complex, it's really large, and this is just a presentation that happens every, every two weeks, just to give us a sense of what, 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 what is happening that is something that we want the community to know, so you can see these updates and you can go back and see them for, for months, if not years. All right, thank you very much, and we will move on to, um, there are no appointments to be made by any of the board members to any of the commission, so we go to the consent calendar where the following items are listed under the consent agenda, and we consider, will be considered as a group and acted upon by one motion with no separate discussion unless a board member so requests. In that event, the item will be removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion and action. There are, I think it's only eight items this time. Uh, are there any items that any of the board members would like to separate to discuss? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to approve items one through eight as presented. There's been a motion. Is there a second? Second. There's been a motion, a second to approve the consent calendar as presented, all eight items. And it is, well, there's no discussion when it's like this. So all those in favor of the motion signify by stating aye. Aye. Anybody, anybody opposed? Motion carries. And we move on to discussion and action items. And the first one will be a report on... Uh, uh, regarding COVID updates and activities to include a discussion of events and activities occurring at the international border that involve or affect county health and emergency management. Now these items keep getting longer and longer because we keep putting everything in there so we can, uh, so we're able to talk about almost anything related to health. Um, so Diana Gomez, uh, Public Health Director with us this morning. Good morning, Supervisor Reyes, members of the board, Diana Gomez, Director of Public Health. Um, so a non-COVID related um, update just because I want to remind all the parents, um, kids are still in their summer break, but they're getting ready to do the preparations to go back to school. And part of that is their school immunization. So the school- You can hear the groans right now. <laughs> groaning from the I kids. Oh, so short. Oh. Um, but like a lot of kids are looking forward to their activities and part of it is the school um, required vaccination. So when you go register, especially if you're a high school student, um, there's a series of, of vaccines that you're required to have. And so um, when you go register, sometimes they, they do an inventory, they check, and we every year provide a clinic for, for parents. It's just like a big event that we host over two weeks. This year it's going to be July 18th through August 4th, excluding the, the weekends from 8.30 to 11.30, and then again from 12.30 to 4, uh, with the last sign-in coming in at 3.45. But those are really successful. Parents have a time to catch up, and sometimes when the school sends them back because they can't register until they have all their paperwork in place, they're able to come over, get their vaccines, run back, and finish that process. So we encourage everybody to plan ahead. And again, um, we're going to be hosting those July 18th through August 4th. I think you're hosting one in San Luis this Thursday. Uh, I'm sorry? I think you're hosting one in San Luis this yeah. Thursday. We try to be really flexible and make sure that we go out to the community. So we've been hosting events, and we're really um, thankful that, again, the community allows us to be there and gives us the space. So, yes, we'll, um, we'll provide updates on our website. Okay. Um, related to COVID, again, um, children's vaccines. Any child over the age of six months is now eligible for a COVID vaccine. <laughs> Um, children that are 5 to 11 can receive a booster of the Pfizer vaccine after five months after completing their first series. And a second booster has been approved for or recommended for anybody that's over the age of 50 who maybe is immunocompromised. Um, and the reason for this, again, is we're seeing our cases go up. It's summer, people are traveling, uh, we're back to a lot of the regular activities. And what we're seeing circulating primarily in our community is a subvariant of the original Omicron um, virus, and so that is BA5. Uh, and so that seems to be the predominant virus circulating in our community. It is up to 54% more transmissible, so that's what we're seeing. It's just more highly transmissible. We also see people have waning immunity, and that's either immunity that you got from vaccines or immunity you got from previous infection. So this particular virus is just more effective at evading both, both types of immunity. They're naturally acquired through a previous infection. So if you had a different 
version of it, you're more likely to be a higher risk to catch this one as well. Um, so again, so that booster is something that you want to consider. Just to give you a local perspective, our numbers um, in June, we had a total of 570 cases. That's a high. We hadn't seen that in a while. Right now, in, in the first week of right now to date in July, today's July what, 7th, um, we have 291 cases so far in the first week. So yeah, our cases are climbing. To give you perspective, the positivity rate right now in our community is about 39%, meaning those are lab reported cases. Those are not the cases that are take home kits. Those are not reported. So these are people that actually went, got a PCR test at a lab and the lab reported it to a state. So of all those tests that are lab reported, um, we're seeing 39% of those in our community come back positive. So again, a reminder to people um, to just continue to enjoy your activities and, and, and you know, do the, the things that you want to do, but do them safely. Take those precautions. Um, also a reminder that we have effective antivirals, and that is a conversation you might want to have with your provider if you're at high risk. Antivirals, um, you know, there's different types, and they what they do is they're really effective at reducing the rate of hospitalization or um, complications. So again, something to keep in mind if you think you're in that high risk group or you know yourself, if you start having symptoms and you experience them getting worse, please do not hesitate seeking treatment from your healthcare provider. There's a lot of options that we have now that can help cut the, the, the duration of the illness, minimize your symptoms and prevent you from getting sick. And although we're seeing those cases um, go up, Fortunately, we haven't seen the spikes that we saw earlier in the pandemic regarding hospitalizations. So again, um, just a reminder to people, continue to do your activities, be mindful, keep those you know, safety precautions in place so that you continue to enjoy the things that you want to enjoy with your families in, in a safe way. Yes, ma'am. Um, blood test to see if your immunity is waning. Um, how do you go about doing that? So there's different places that offer that. I, I'm not sure if you can get it through your doctors, um, but I know there's a there was a clinical study that was being conducted um, with healthcare workers. There, there was open to law enforcement. I think some members of the public. I believe Regional Center for Border Health was offering that. I, I can't say for certainty without verifying with them that they're still offering that. But they they were part of that clinical study and they were offering those tests. All right. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to comment something. It is getting to a point now that the people that are testing in a local, you know, in a lab or in a lab setting or in a local setting of testing that isn't at home are people who already took a test home or who feel like they feel sick. So that, that, that rate is a little twisted nowadays because people used to test themselves just to test themselves. Now they test themselves because they feel they, they have something or they already tested at home in one of those home tests and they, they tested positive, so they want something to take to the job site to tell them or something. So to me, the, the key um, uh, marker that we wanna watch closely is hospitalizations and death, because that, is, that to me would mean that the, that the new wave of infections has really been, is really a powerful one that sending people to the hospital, uh, which is again, one more thing we need to emphasize to people that just being vaccinated does not technically prevent you from getting COVID. It just makes you so that the symptoms of what you get are not are manageable, basically, from home. And I also remind everybody that if you're going to get treatment, you get it early. As soon as you find out, you know, the treatment works only when it's taken in the early stages. It doesn't work as well when you already got COVID and it's really bad and you can't breathe. Uh, you know, those are, I think, uh, I think we need to have, put out a health, uh, health department directive, basically advising people that, you know, don't wait. Uh, if you have the symptoms, get tested. If you have it, get treatment and get it soon. And now local providers, I think, are able to just simply give you a prescription and you may be able to get some of these medicines off the, a simple Yeah, pharmacy. they're available locally. And it, again, you make a really good point about early treatment because I think a lot of people delay that. Um, this particular version of the virus that circulated, um, the symptoms are a little different than before. Um, it seems to be, again, more um, centralized in your upper respiratory tract. So a lot of people start with their first symptoms, sometimes it's a sore throat. So they <laughs> kind of minimize it, yeah. <laughs> and then it kind of, you know, you, so just, just a reminder to get tested again, the PCR test again will catch it uh, with more accuracy than a home test. But that early treatment, it's available. Um, and it's available for um, ages 12 and up. 
So, um, you know, sometimes some of those early ones were only available for adults. Um, so one of the more uh, popular one is Paxlovid, and that's an oral um, uh, antiviral. You also have them, you know, some of the monoclonal antibody therapies are still available. But yes, early is the key. And what we don't want to do is we don't want to overwhelm the hospital care system who's been struggling, again, with dealing with the influx and also healthcare workers. So um, that's, that's an issue. So again, remember, stay if safe. You, if you test positive at home, mm -hmm. isolate. Yes. That's important because otherwise everybody at your house is going to pick it up. Even you know, if you're people, not symptomatic, people, yes. Yes. People need to have with them the available resources. They need to have masks, good quality masks. They need to be cognizant of the fact that if someone picks it up at home, it is more likely to be picked up by somebody else at the household than anywhere else because you live in an, enc an enclosed environment. So there, I think it's time for us to send out some sort of directive explaining this process as to people in general so that we get to deal with this with that again. I mean, the numbers are astounding because people just don't think. I mean, everywhere you go and there's a big crowd, there's three or four people wearing masks and everybody else is not. And I think that's just... It's, it's, I think it's normal, we just don't want to anymore, but I think that this is some of the outcome of just not wanting to follow simple procedures. It, it's, it helped us with, even with the flu to, to just wear a mask and to wash your hands continually, continue with those habits. Those are good habits to have. And we need to remind people that it is on their own behalf that they you know, take these precautions. It's, it's gonna help them and it's gonna help the community. You certainly don't want to miss three days of work or four days of work. And when you go back, people are looking at you funny because you had COVID. <laughs> now, information, we want people to have information that's accurate and um, so that they can use it to make the best inf the best decision possible. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Chairman, go up. wake up, Lynn um, and Diana. Mm -hmm. Would it be, um, would it be a, maybe do a PSA and let people know that our numbers are up and that they might want to consider um, wearing yeah, we can we can talk to um, Kevin about doing some messaging, and again, you know what what we want to do is we want to make sure people have the the information um, that they need. And again, being prepared, especially if you have like plans, if you're going on a trip, we've seen lots of those canceled uh, because they had to take a test and they didn't, um, you know, they didn't realize they were sick. Yeah. What we're seeing the infectiousness of this um, is. You are at your peak two days before you even show symptoms to two days after. Oh, so wow. again, just being, if you know you're going to be in a, you know, outdoors is better than in, which is hard for us right now. But again, so taking simple precautions, you know, um, so that you can continue to do what you, you need to do and do it safely. You know, some PSAs to let people know our numbers are going up and that we might want to consider, you might want to consider wearing masks up and, you know, big groups. Crowded, crowded spaces. Yeah. And then... We're still providing vaccines, correct? Yes, we have our vaccine clinic um, that's going on every day except for Friday. Our clinical partners are doing that as well. We're still working with different agencies to provide them PPE. Um, rapid tests are available at all your library um, um, centers, buildings, I guess. Library, yeah. Yeah, yeah libraries. libraries. Libraries are awesome. Stop by and learn everything they're doing. But we're very fortunate that they, um, they allow us to, to have that venue. Um, to do that. So yes, so there's not a shortage right now. And so again, just being prepared, having the information, having some sort of game plan in place so that if, if, if that happens, you're prepared um, and that way it doesn't catch anybody off guard. One, one last comment. It is more um, sort of a, an observation. Uh, you know, I've, I've been to some of those quick testing sites and um, you know, my problem is when somebody tests positive, there's really no way to dispose of that test that I, I feel is a safe way to dispose of that test. It should, it should be like insulin shots or something like that. You know, yeah, we, we need to have a biohazard bag or something where these people dispose of that. Because I see them being disposed in the garbage can. Mm -hmm. You know, it just it, I know it's supposed to be contained inside, but it's still pretty dangerous to just move them around. So uh, advisory kind of thing to the providers of those quick tests is that they should treat the positive test, any kind of test, as bio, environmentally biohazard or some, you know, so they treat it with a little more care. Put it in the garbage can. It's not the way I would think you dispose of something that essentially is a virus that can be spread anywhere. Uh, you're putting at risk, you know, sanitation workers. You're doing a lot of stuff like that. So just in those, in those particular situations, just a reminder, safety is, should be the utmost concern. 
Thank you very much, Diana. Is there anything else? You guys are doing a great job. I mean, you know, I know you're not responsible for the numbers of going up. But, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but thank you for keeping an eye on it. Thank you. Uh, Tony, I think I see you in a mask there. Uh, you know, I, I hope you didn't test positive and just came over. <laughs> Everywhere I turn around, though, people are uh, testing positive. Tony Badia, Director of Emergency Management, Yuma County. I really don't have any updates on the, the numbers. The uh, June numbers aren't out yet with cvp.gov. Um, I'll get that probably at the next meeting. Uh, echoing what Diana is saying, I know that the uh, uh, Regional Center for Border Health has seen the increase in their workers uh, testing positive for COVID, uh, and they're making those efforts to try to address that so they can bring those down. The same thing with some of the first responders out there. You know, I get to see it firsthand because people are now coming in to get the test, and they're already positive. So anytime they come into a building to take a test and they're not wearing a mask and they test positive immediately, you know that there's going to probably be a problem there. Uh, I think we need to emphasize tests should be taken in a location that's separate from the main building. And we talk about the libraries. I mean, you don't want people going into the library testing positive and then finding out they're positive when they're actually looking at you and talking to you without a mask. So they're, they're, we should be start to develop some protocols mm -hmm. for those testing sites to follow. They should be done in an outside area, ventilated, whatever it is that it's a best practice type situation. I know I said that, kind of kind of said that to the health department, but uh, emergency service is going to become a, a pretty constant uh, service that we would have to provide in the future, Tony. So getting ready to do that, you know, putting enough resources into it, it's critical to us. It's the same as the health department function has totally changed. I used to think of the health department as people who check, you know, the restaurants and, you know, those kind of things. And now I think of them as a, as our front line for infections like this. And it's, it's a different task. It's a much more intensive task. And I think the same thing is going to happen, and it's happening already to your position. It used to be kind of a more laid back position. And this is going, this is. We'll, we'll take that, sir. Well, it was kind of laid back. Get position. back to laid back. There wasn't that many emergencies. It was mostly training. Now you have to actually Tommy deal with it. Tommy does good at laid back. Yeah, I'll work <laughs> on that. back guy. The first name is Tony. All right, so, OK. So. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Is there anything else? Okay. Hi. All right. So that takes care of item number one. We move on to discussion and possible action regarding applications for the position Yuma County Recorder, including the potential action to appoint an individual to the position. And let me just make it clear: I, I don't. I am not ready to appoint anyone to the position, and I don't know if any of the board members have ever said that this is what's a process where we select someone today. This is going to be a process, as far as I'm concerned, that is going to require a little more attention. Uh, I, I think I saw the announcement from the Human Resource Department. It said that the deadline to apply was July 15. So how, how do you, you know, if, I mean, it kind of. I was kind of surprised. Mr. Yeah, Chairman. I saw the announcement. So that means to me we have to wait until after the the, the deadline for the applications to actually take any action. Otherwise, we may have somebody apply next week and say, well, what happened? Uh, but uh, how many of, the, of you all here are basically uh, applicants? Uh, submit an application. One, two, three. Okay. Four. Four. Uh, look, the first thing we need to say is out, out in the open, people who apply for an elected position like that, they have my greatest, sincerest appreciation. I mean, it's not an easy job to be an elected official nowadays, no matter what position is. And that position in itself is a really difficult one because we as Board of Supervisors sort of made it that way. This was done at the request of the county recorder herself. You know, we combined the elections department with the recorder department because we felt that the person in charge could handle both of them, and she requested that. Before that, it used to be a separate entity, a separate organization. It was the elections department reporting directly to the supervisors, and it was the recorders reporting directly to the supervisors. And the elections director position was a um, not even an appointed position. It was more like an employee at a, at a high level employee, like a, 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 a director. A director. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm, we're going to be looking, and we've got all your applications, and we, we can read them. And, and we'll get to the point where we just probably narrow it down to two or three choices and make that appointment. I wanted Robin to be here. Unfortunately, she's on vacation. But there is a a committee that we, an elections department committee that we made up of two board supervisors, the county recorder, the attorney, and the administrator, that I think probably would be best 
position to actually go through these applications and sort of give us uh, two or three recommendations. Uh, this is one of those things that can get political really fast, and I really hate to get it to that level. I think that we've been able to sort of not deal with it that way, and it was because Robin made it that way. Uh, I certainly don't want to start the process by saying, no, you're this or you're that, or you believe that or you believe that. Uh, it's not. The recorder's oh. position is a pretty much an administrative position that requires people to understand a little bit or to be wanting to understand a little bit what the process of, but it's a recorder. It, it was not initially at all an elections type situation, but there was a lot of election crossover with the registration happening at the recorder's office, those type of things. I believe we need, as a matter of fact, the next item in the agenda is for us to take a look at that situation. And, and I think a lot of it will depend to me on the qualifications of the person that's taking over the job. You know I mean? If, a, if it's a qualified individual that knows what they're doing, they should know the separation between those two. Um, I, I was thinking about the agreement. The agreement expires December 20, I think 31st of 2022. So I'm not sure that at this particular time, just before a, a primary election and just before a lot of election uh, uh, takes place, a lot of take, that we are really, that we really want to put someone right in the middle of that and say, okay, well, here, you handle this. So we need to think those things through a little bit, but we, I, I like this process to be the least disrupt, disruptive possible, dis, the least disruptive that it can be. And for that, I, I, I want to talk about it with the rest of the board and see if they're willing to sort of hand over this process to that committee, to that elections committee, and let the elections committee go, go through this. It's not, I wouldn't call it the election committee anymore, but they're, they're, it, the makeup I like, the two supervisors, one from one party, one from the other one, the, the county administrator, the county attorney's office, or representative, and uh, uh, Robin. And I wanted to ask Robin if she was willing to do that. Uh, otherwise, we won't take a resignation. <laughs> she will continue serving until, you know, it's true, actually. Yeah, it is. It just, yeah. it, it, you know, it just so happens that for that resignation to be effective, we have to approve it. She'll be it. a county employee, so you can... Well, yeah, but, I mean, there's a difference. She'll be a county employee and the county recorder at the same time mm. if she doesn't know. I, I, I wanted to ask her because I don't feel that we can impose that kind of an obligation on someone. Right, I think we should postpone this. <clears throat> well, I, I think we need, need to make some decisions about the process, and that's what I like to do. I like to make sure that everybody knows that this isn't going to drag on for a long time. Like I said, it's, it is already unfair to put you in the middle of a situation like this. It would make it even worse if we waited too long to do this. I think July 18 is a date that she gave us. Uh, we may be ready by the July, what is it, 18? Mm -hmm. Meeting to, to make an appointment, but I think that would that would uh, that would be made a lot easier for all of us if instead of interviewing everyone and getting everyone's views, which we have on paper, we did it that way. But because we're bound by state law, we have to be open about the process. We have to take it in like we're doing it in public. Um, I I I think that anyone that applied is you know understands the the task they're getting into the job that comes with it the responsibilities that come with it i don't think anyone is going to make an application for this position without thinking through that it's going to change your life <laughs> and it's going to make you it's going to change your life and it's going to make you the point of attention and some things that you may or may not like um, you know this is a very difficult uh, politics is difficult in itself but you know being right in the middle of a primary or you know being right in the middle of a midterm election it's really not the time uh, you know but that's that's robin's decision and i think we have to respect that she uh, she did it for her own personal reasons but i would i would ask the rest of the board are you kind of would you consider kind of appointing doing an appointment not the elections committee itself but just the appointment along those lines and appointing two supervisors by appointing two supervisors, we're making sure that a lot of this process takes place in a little more private setting. I mean, three supervisors will make it a, uh, open, a forum. Open. Mm -hmm. I don't know if just the fact that we appoint an election committee makes that an open public type situation anyway. But I think I wanted to give them a little more privacy than, than what we get. What, what is your opinion? Mr. Chairman, if, the, if your committee is appointed by you, it will be a public body for purposes of open meeting law. If you have a committee appointed um, to advise the administrator or somebody to bring a recommendation to you, that may not fall under that. Well, I, I like to give the 
the people involved in this process a little more leeway in, in interviewing candidates and contacting candidates and making sure that the candidates understand what's important. In other words, the, to me, there needs to be a process. This is a too important of a position to just simply discuss it and then say, well, my favorite is so-and-so or I like so-and-so. I, I, I find that to be a little disturbing, for lack of a better word, that we, we just simply go that, through that process. I'd like to take a little more time, do a little better review, and postpone it as much as possible to, so we can make, at least try to make the best decision possible based on the facts. I have a question about the July 15th date. So we have to leave it open? But well, that's what it says. That's it, what the announcement says. It was says. the 5th, not July 5th, not the 15th. Oh, not the 15th, yeah. July 5th. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I look at that and uh, wake up. Thank you, I thought it was Ju July 15th, so it was the 5th. Good, we're done so the with closing, that part. So the closing was today? Yesterday? No. Yesterday. Yeah. Yesterday. 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 Yeah. Well, anyway, I still like to take some time. Go ahead. Excuse me, Chairman Reyes, members of the board, Felicia yes. Procedo, Director. What the vacancy said is that for the upcoming impending resignation of our current recorder, July 18th, that we would be accepting letters of interest up until July 5th, so that this way you would have some letters to present to you today. But it's not closed. I mean, it's really your direction as to how you would like to proceed, and then we will continue to acquire other letters of interest, whatever is your direction. Mm. All right. Man, I gotta, we just got this new thing, little note, right? I, we were, I was used to the big screen, and I guess I didn't amplify it, so I looked at that as, as if. 15, but um, I still, again, I, I, we're not, I'm not mm -hmm. ready to make a decision yet. I just, I've read the, the applications. There was one, I think, done yesterday, yes. which was in front of us today. So, you know, I'd like to, if, you, if you're not interested in going through a process, or if you're interested as a board to go through the process ourselves and ask the questions ourselves, you'd be, I'd be more than glad to, 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 to do it that way. But I feel like we need to take some time with this, a little bit more time with this, even if we have to make Robin wait a little longer, which I, we may not have to. I mean, we have a meeting there. What, what is what is the pleasure? Uh, and if somebody is appointed on the 18th and that's the same day as, then we won't be without a recorder at all. We just don't accept her. Well, no, no, that, that triggers a different process. Mr. Right? Chairman, to, to clarify, you will not be without a recorder. You cannot have a vacant elected position right. like that. Yeah. She will be a holdover. Whether she shows up to the office or not is a different story, but she will be the recorder. Okay. Thank oh, you. that's yeah. that's why I, I wanted to talk to a person. And just on, to clarify, I'm looking at your IGA for your elected advisory committee. The purpose of that committee is not to select. I know. A, to fill that position. From a county attorney standpoint, I would recommend you folks do the interviews yourself and let the committee come up with your questions and do it openly. That's just my opinion. Okay. All right. Well, what we're going to do is come up with a series of questions. We're going to ask everyone the same questions so that we don't have anything. And we'll do it in an open meeting. We'll call for a meeting. Um, a if we, meeting well, yeah. we could call for a special meeting or actually so we can get to the 18th ready. Mm -hmm. I also recommend, keep in mind that you have an election coming up August 2nd. The sooner yeah. you fill this position, the better off you'll be, or this person. And um, Agreed. Understand that whoever gets appointed is going to have to run at the next general election. 24. Well, that's yeah. why it's a serious position. Yes. And that's why we need everybody to, that applies to understand what they're coming into. And I know all of you are here, and the ones that applied, I'm sure, uh, uh, know this. So what we'll do then is call for a meeting uh, to just simply do all the process of interviewing you know, and then come up with a recommendation for the full board. We may make that decision that same day of the meeting or we'll make it the 18th. Is that uh, a process that we can follow? I, I believe so. I think that'll be the, the fairest and the most open and easiest process at this point. I mean, well, okay, so it'd be like, a, like interviewing for the county administrator but doing it ourselves. I, I think so. I mean, this is an elected position. It's not really an employee position. Um, it's a very important position, especially this time of year and this year uh, during a general election. And um, I know you have considerations on your next item to consider whether or not to amend your IGA to move election director position back under administration, which maybe with a new recorder coming in, maybe something you'd like to think about. I don't know. Well, I, I don't think we have time. I, I think that 
you have you need 60 days to cancel that you, so you that know if, you, if both parties agree to the iga I, we consider an amendment <coughs> to the iga with the instant cancelization and remove oh. that well those are again the options available to us and um you know the, the the fact is whatever option we take it's going to have to be an option that interviews some sort of interview some sort of a one-on-one -on -one thing and if if it's better to keep it out in the open and better ask these questions to each and every one of you then fine i have no problem with that i I think it's great. Um, so please stay in touch. Uh, we will let you know what the process is going to be and call you in as we as we as we figure out just what the questions are going to be without getting too much into the details of what they're going to be. We'll make sure that they meet legal muster. I mean, there might be some questions that we may not be able to ask. I'd like to find out before we start this process. So you will all your applications have been duly recorded. They all came in before the fifth. Where and like the human resource department says, we don't have like a cutoff date, but that we, I consider that to be a cutoff date. I think it's, it's just being fair, but, but like I said, there's no cutoff date until the day that we make the appointment, I suppose, uh, in this particular position. Uh, it's, and I just want to say that so that everybody listening, if anybody is listening to this or hear, seeing this or hearing this, uh, this is a position that has to be filled by a Republican. So. And I hope everybody understands that they have to be of the Republican Party to be appointed because we're appointing a replacement Republican. So having said that, I think we're going to move on. I think the, the instructions are going to be that we'll set up a, a meeting where we'll interview and then we'll we'll try to get this done before the 18th. Right? Good. Okay. Right. Well, I, I again, I want to thank you. And if you guys are, were all ready to be interviewed. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not what we were going to do today. We're just going to get your, we just got your packages. We just got the one from yeah, from yesterday, I think, today. So it wouldn't be fair for us to start making decisions right now and put you all in the public and out in front of the public and ask you a bunch of questions. We don't even know what they're going to be yet. We're going to have to come up with four or five different questions and we'll see what your answers are and then make decisions based upon those answers. So thank you very much for being here, for coming. We're going to move into the second one, which is a discussion about whether we keep the elections department under the recorder's office or whether we move it back to what it used to be, what it used to be was a department that reported to the supervisors on what's going on. Um, so uh, I'm moving into that. It's discussion possible action regarding, uh, wait a minute, discussion possible action regarding whether to amend, cancel, or continue the current agreement combining the offices of the recorder and election service. I would say we wait and see who gets appointed. And then after that, if that person seems capable and willing to take on that responsibility and we feel comfortable with it, we can make a decision then uh, with a new person. Uh, that new person may just simply say, look, I want to be a recorder. I don't want to be involved in whatever happens in an election. And if it, that's the case, then we'll take the responsibility. It's why they pay us the big bucks, some people would say, to take the responsibility on. So why don't we wait until we appoint that person and find out if that person is capable and willing to take on the elections department, which is, I mean, right now, probably the toughest job in the county, other than the health department job. It's probably the toughest job in the county, trying mm -hmm. to keep that going um, that way. So we are, we're going to also continue this to the, after the meeting that we select the individual that will serve as the county recorder. Uh, so we move on just, to- Just, what, a, just oh. a comment, uh, Mr. Chair. Sure. You know, the, um, I remember when uh, the recorder, Robin Paquette, um, came to us and, and she wanted to bring or bring those two departments together it was because there's like you said there's a lot of crossover and those departments need to be in link with certain especially legislation and if one elections department is not synced with, synced the, with mm -hmm. the recorder then uh, it's it just a constant back and forth mm -hmm. and more time so I mean, it was very unique because not in Arizona, I think we're the only ones that are doing it. So, I mean, and Robin did a great job. Uh, I know it's going to be for someone new to come in and and uh, it's, it's going to be hard, but uh, we'll, we'll look at it, like you said, and, 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 uh, and, and see if, uh, if that person is willing to take it. But even though if, if, it, if, if that person's not willing to take it, the communication needs to be there. Mm -hmm. That's it, it says a lot. With the uh, recorder for, and the, for, and for the, the elections can't operate yes, in a silo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to Martin's point, that's probably why Mark, um, Robin was one of the best performing recorders in the entire state and recognized because she was able to access the information 
-hmm. and provide solutions when confronted with challenges um, during the reporting process, during uh, registration process, and especially during elections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's going to be, it's kind of, it's going to be bad for us to, to not have that certainty about the position that we've had so far. I mean, Robin was doing an excellent job, and she's still doing an excellent job, and, and it's one of those situations where it's not by choice. We, we're, we're, we're faced with a situation that, you know, it's a situation. We need to deal with it, and we will deal with it, <coughs> and we'll deal with it as expediently as possible. Okay. The the good thing the good thing is that she's still gonna be here working for the county, so I'm okay. sure we'll have Leon access and, to her. And the resources will, of her knowledge and we'll background. Let her um, help out when when there's need, and uh, she I think she she's more willing to do that. Well, it's mostly good, but it can be bad if we get a little, a little independent person in there that you know likes to do their ways you know, do their things their way because it's always tough to have, you know, to fill those kind of shoes and have that person, you know, nearby. Um, it, it's, it's, it's the Cash 22 situation. You really need the help because unless you've been the, the, the deputy director for a while, then you need to have somebody explain that to you at the same time. It's going to be an elected position sometime soon, and it's going to require someone to to understand just what the tasks are and to be able to adapt to it. And I think most of the candidates, if not all the candidates that we've got so far, they all have the desire to do the job. Whether they can do the job is going to be a matter of, you know, interviewing them and knowing a little more about their, their capacity, their background. But, I mean, it, what it takes first and foremost is someone that wants to do the job and learn while doing it because you're not going to step in there being a county recorder. You're going to step in there being someone that wants to be the best county recorder. And you're going to step into a situation that is unique in some ways in the state. Uh, and, and so it's going to take a little bit of coaching. And it just, it's good to have that available resource or that resource available to you. And it's not someone that retires and moves to Alaska. Uh, you know, then it's tough, it's tough to get that advice. I think you're going to find that Robin is going to be very accommodating with anyone that uh, wants to do that job. I know she probably remembers when she first stepped into it. And, um, you know, she learned the, the, the trade and she became one of the best ones in the state, if not the country. The best, yeah. Uh, so, so I mean, no, we're not going to keep going like that because, you know, she may want to okay. not leave or something and then we're going through this process. She, she may want to. And, and let me remind everyone, we don't control the salary. So <laughs> yeah. let's not negotiate the salary. That's a state statute. It's by state statute. So, you know, you get paid what you get paid. That's not the, the the main issue here. And I hope you all know what you get paid because, as I pointedly say most times, uh, sometimes you get paid a lot less than what you think you're worth, and sometimes you're worth a lot less than what you think you are. So you know, hopefully, it was one of those things where we fit. You know, we we fit the bill. All right. Any other comments? If not, then we move on. And thank you again, everybody that's here for that position. Thank you again. I know you took time this morning. It's just so it's, it's a Wednesday morning, and I know you took the time to be here. So we appreciate that. And that is your first big step, and it's a good step you took. So thank you. Uh, we're moving on to the Department of uh, Development Service and Planning and Zoning Division discussion concerning possible text amendment to the Yuma County Zoning Ordinance to change the maximum height of fences, exempt from the permit requirements, and to increase the maximum height of fences was to seven feet in residential and rural areas only in districts. There will be a dreaded PowerPoint presentation. Mm -hmm. I am not asking anyone to stay for that other than Maggie, who, who will be running it. So Maggie, oh, who, who is it? Oh, there you go. I, oh, I thought you were another attorney. I'm trying to, you know, like, like not Thank look you, Mr. Chairman, too much. Mr. Chairman, senior planner presenting a proposed amendment to the Yuma County Zoning Ordinance, section 309, paragraph C, paragraph two to change the maximum height of fences exempt from permit requirements and section 1108.03 to increase the maximum height of fences walls to seven feet in residential and rural area zoning district. Currently, the requirement requirement is six feet. Yuma County adopted the 2018 International Residential Code in May 1st, 2019. Specifically, section R105.2 were exempt from permit, impacted section 309 and section 1108.03. So we're proposing the changes as follow. Text that is a strike through format is intended to be deleted and text in bold letters is proposed new text to be added. Would you like me, Mr. Chairman, would you like me to read every slide or just point out where the change is happening? Well, we can see. 
Yeah, changing the, fences from six feet to seven foot. Yeah, bottom. Or bottom less. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the one only with fix, uh, changing the, deleting the word six and the number six and replacing it with the word seven and the number seven throughout the slides. Bottom paragraph. Uh, I have one question before you leave that. Um, and, and that's a question that's a little technical in nature, but you may have the answer for this. Does having a seven foot fence require a different footing? Because people do not understand what they're getting sometimes. Six feet requires, you know, let's say 12 inches uh, of footing, which is the concrete base. Seven feet, does it require wider footing? Does it require deeper footing? Because people, people don't, don't, don't understand what they're getting sometimes. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do not know. See, I told you it was a technical question. I have a question. Uh, be because you see, I, anytime you increase the height of a fence, you increase the depth of the footing, you increase the width of the footing, and that people are going to try to build seven foot fences on, on the footing made for six foot, and it's going to come down with the wind. When they get the permit, they're, they're going to know. Oh, well, I, guess, know. I guess so, yeah. But, but no, wait. I just want to make sure this is a permissive, right? This, this is not requiring seven foot fences. Right, it's, it's, requir it's, it's going up to seven foot, but you can do a six foot fence, a five foot fence, a four foot fence. They just need to be aware that when they go to seven, there may be some changes. And I don't know if there's any. Mr. Chairman, um, correct. Uh, they can build anything up to seven, seven feet on uh, private Same property. Point. However, um, because the a, a fence that is seven feet or less in height doesn't require a permit, uh, we don't know whether uh, the footing is any different than uh, a fence that is six feet in height. A permit will not be required. If they increase the height to over, se over seven feet, they will need uh, permits and a variance from the Board of Adjustment. I, I get that. And, I, and I, I just want to make sure that people don't get what they ask for and don't know what they're asking for. A seven foot fence, it's just a foot higher, but it may require you know, a wider footing because anytime you go high or higher, it requires better and more heavier you know, footing. And when we allow people to build seven foot fences without a permit, and there is no particular warning, you know, you need to be careful. We may be having a bunch of fences come down in a windstorm, and then they'll blame the county for allowing them to build seven foot fences without telling them there's a, well, I, I know we're not in the business of telling everybody how to do things, but we are kind of in the business of telling how to people. If we allow seven foot fences, I wanna make sure that there is a warning or if this, if it's needed, that there is some sort of a note there that says, please consult with something about, you know, your footings or some, something along the, the lines that, because what we're giving is people, we're giving people the, basically the, the, the go ahead to build seven foot fences without a permit. That's what we're doing. And I'd like to know if by doing that, we are not allowing, un, well, not unsafe. We wouldn't allow unsafe things, I mean, period. I mean, we require people to have a three foot pool to get a fence around it. So we're not in the business of allowing things that are hazardous. But this one here, technically speaking, for me, building a seven foot fence on a, on a residential house without a building permit may be getting to a point where if it falls on someone, we may have a liability problem. Mr. Chairman, yes. currently they can build walls up to seven Six. feet. But if they will require a variance from the Yuma County Zoning Ordinance to exceed that foot. Over seven needs a permit. Over seven needs a permit. So currently they can build, but they will require, a uh, variance will be required to deviate from that requirement. Okay, or seven, right? But currently they can build up to six. Yep. But now yes. we're saying you can build up to seven. Mr. Chairman, they can build up to seven without a, I mean, they can build, if they go to seven feet, they need a variance. Okay. Does that mean a permit? No. A permit is after seven. Oh, I just, if it's any higher than seven, it's a More or less, it's taking the variance out. It's either you do a, the wall or you have to get the permit for the higher. I, I, well, look, I, am, I am one of those guys that think government, you know, it's just too much regulations. But that one there, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of, it's kind of close to, to me because I've seen some walls, six foot walls go down with wind. Mm -hmm. And normally that's because they're not doing the footings well. They don't have enough rebar going up, or they, they got something in there that's making that wall. I've I built fences with very thin walls, and I've built fences that oh, most of the time, if not all the time, they're all six footers. And I've seen some of them come down in the wind, normally because, again, they're not 
done well. I know a seven footer is gonna come down the same way a six footer is gonna come down. I just don't want the county to be allowing this to happen without some preliminary studies about whether you know, you can build a six foot fence or a seven foot fence with the same kind of footings because people will, in, in their, in their <coughs> desire to save money, uh, you know, will keep the same footings for a seven footer as they do for a six footer. And I just don't want the county to be in a liability position where something comes down and they say, well, nobody told us, <coughs> so we built a seven foot fence, we, we don't need a permit. And we will say, well, you didn't get a permit, so the county is not responsible. Mr. Chairman, just to clarify, you don't need a permit today for seven foot. You just need a variance, but also recognize the 2018 International Residential Code uh, does exempt the seven foot from a permit. I don't know if that causes you to have any more comfort, but it's there. And, and this would be consistent since you adopted it back I in 2019. Yeah, well, I don't. <laughs> Look, again, it's a permissive require regulation, and I know it will make it more like normal. Um, I don't know what the cities do or does or do, or whatever, uh, but I just wanted to make sure that we mentioned that, and I hope, because it doesn't require a permit, I feel like, okay, well, all we're doing is just simply allowing people to go up to seven feet. We're not giving them advice on how to you know, build it and stuff, but I'm just concerned that people you give people what they want, sometimes they don't know what, what they're getting. They, they know what they want, but they don't know what they're getting. And I, I have a very, very, very close relationship with fences. We, we, we build them in every subdivision. And I tell you, I've seen some of them come down, pieces of them come down, and they're supposed to be built up to a certain standard um, that is checked by a by government entity. And even when that, when you get a windstorm and it's the middle of nowhere or something, I mean, it's difficult for me to, to, to sleep well knowing there's a retention basin that may, some, may not take all the water that comes down. People just don't get a sense of that until they see it in action. I've seen it in action. I've seen walls come down, the six-foot walls. And I've seen residents complain, why did my wall come down? And it's just windy. It just happens to get a, whist of, a, a gust of wind and it knocks it down. But the, I'm digressing. Uh, let's just get back to the seven foot allowance. I said, if it's okay with the rest of the board, I guess. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I brought this to Maggie because I'm getting a lot of calls from residents in the foothills. A lot of people with COVID are turning their backyards into resorts, more or less, and they're just wanting the privacy to go along with it. Especially if you're very, if your elevations, you've got one house behind that's a little lower or a little higher and they can look right into people's backyards so that's where this uh, you know i'm building three-story buildings now uh, that privacy issue is becoming a big <laughs> issue because somebody living in the third story you know, they're going to see everybody's backyard from there especially if you put them up on top of a hill but uh, again I, i'm not I, you know we, let's be consistent and i i think we're we're consistent with the if we're consistent with the code and if we're consistent with the cities and stuff I, I think we're okay i just wanted to make sure we didn't get into a liability issue and i brought it up if it requires if you build a seven foot fence and without a permit and without a variance you're on your own right you've been allowed to by statute by that's, mail that's the way it is right now yeah I think you need a variance to go up to seven feet. Well, six feet. I mean, oh, six feet. I mean, they strong. fall. They still fall, so mm -hmm. they're on their own. Okay. Not, the, Mr. Chairman, I think the reason why the county needs a variance is because you you adopted the the IRC 2018, but you didn't adjust your height requirement or the height. So it's inconsistent. So Right, let's make it consistent. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I vote to make it consistent. I'll second that. <laughs> I'm reluctant it will go along with that. But, I want to make it clear to everybody that's seen this. It is, I, I, beware. I mean, don't build a high fence and don't think, that, you know, you need to make sure your footings are right. Um, there's been a motion and a second. Any more discussion? I'll make the motion that we approve uh, Department of Development Services Planning and Zoning Division discussion <clears throat> concerning the possible text amendment to the Uni County Zoning Ordinance, sections 309.00 and 11. I think, I think his first one was better. But what he means is approving the item as presented. You ask him to Are read. Do you let me finish it? No. <laughs> 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 Mr. Chairman, from the county attorney standpoint, we prefer you read the recommendation. All right, read it. <laughs> to change the maximum height of fences? Exempt from permit requirements and to increase the maximum height of fences 
slash walls to seven feet in residential and rural area zoning districts. Well, I would like her was offensive, but it's okay. <laughs> All right. So there's a motion. In the, is that a second? That I heard yeah, from you? Lynn seconded. Oh, Lynn seconded. I seconded oh, it. All right. Sorry. I'm sorry. No, it's, no don't be sorry. <laughs> uh, people building seven foot fences will be sorry. Uh, all right, so there's been a motion and a second to approve the item as read. Uh, is there any discussion? Anything else, Mo? Mr. Uh, Chairman, the uh, motion would be to send this item to the Planning and Zoning Commission to initiate a text amendment. Yeah. All right, I, I got that. It's just the beginning of a process. <laughs> well, you read it textually, so. And thank you, Maggie. Yeah, thanks. Mm. All right, so all those in favor of the motion signify by stating aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Uh, yeah, we need the guy from the, you know, playing zoning division. Ah, no, he, just, he just left. He didn't even finish, and he left. All right, so the next item is uh, county administration, discussion regarding legislative issues, discussion and possible action regarding state and federal legislative updates, which may include international issues, status of bills affecting Yuma County timelines, and composition of the legislatures and legislative strategies and priorities. Uh, Alejandro, I think you're going to tell us now the good news. The legislature is out. Not sure. Well, Mr. Chairman, good morning, members of the board. Um, I will be presenting the legislative update today, and I do have good news. After a little more than 166 days, uh, the 55th legislature second re regular session officially came to a close at 12.25 a.m. on Saturday, June 25th. The state legislature brought the budget stalemate to an end with a bicameral, bipartisan agreement that included extra education spending. The almost $18 billion spending plan includes a $1 billion for $1 million for transportation, airport, and parks infrastructure, $1.16 billion for K-12 and higher education one-time ongoing spending, $1.14 billion in state pension reduction, over $500 million for border security, $270 million for state salary adjustments, and $120 million in access and DES provider rate increases. Additionally, there's a, uh, there was also $1 billion for the long-term water augmentation fund. Finally, uh, 400, plus $425 million in the rainy day fund to help the state weather a potential recession. It's also worth mentioning that, the more, bills, that more bills were introduced during this, this session than the previous one, which was already a record-breaking one. Mm -hmm. Now, the governor has until tomorrow, July the 7th, to sign or veto the bills through both chambers. And the general effective date for the bills will be September 24th, uh, which is 90 days after signed die. Now, the CSX Executive Director, Craig Sullivan, is scheduled to be here before you in the coming weeks to report on the budget in much greater detail, and more specifically on those budget items that have a direct impact on counties, like the one uh, time $53 million stipend for sheriffs across the state, probation officers 2.5 salary increase, 2.5% salary increase. Uh, Justice, of, Justice of the Peace salary cost share going back to 60-40 and saving the counties around 1.4 million and some other election and COVID related bills that made it to the governor's desks. Um, I'm also happy to share with you that uh, Senate Bill 1490, which appropriates $33 million for this, from the state general fund in fiscal year 2022 2023 to the Department of Transportation to construct, widen, repair, and upgrade Cesar Chavez Boulevard in the city of San Luis was signed into law on June 30th by Governor Ducey. Now, I would like to share with the public that the Yuma County Board of Supervisors sent a letter to our state senators and representatives in appreciation for their continued support during the 2022 second regular legislative session. On the federal level, I would like to share with the public as well that Yuma County will be very well represented by Supervisors Pancrasi and Borges at the 2022 National Association of Counties um, Conference to take place in Adams County, Colorado from July 21st through July 24th. They will be meeting with hundreds of other county elected officials from across the nation. Um, and I'll be attending the local first of Arizona's 15th Annual Rural Policy Forum, August 3 through the 5th in Winslow, Arizona. On the international front, the Arizona Border Counties Coalition, which Yuma County is part of, sent a letter to Senator Sinema and Kelly requesting their support of increased funding for the EPA's Border Water Infrastructure Program. 
to 100 million in the interior and an environment appropriations bill for fiscal year 2023. Moving Alex, on. Is that, that going to sure. be impacted by the court's decision last week or this week, the court decision taking some wow. of the power from EPA? Well, there was a Supreme Court decision basically mm -hmm. taking a lot of the power that EPA has to set regulations uh, that control the environment. Greenhouse gases yeah. and uh, right to the waterways. Yeah. I just want you to, to, to look and look that up. I, I'm sure that it's fairly new, but it may have an impact on all these regulations now. It will. Yeah. All right. They'll tie their hands. Congress must enact laws, basically with the summation. All right. Now moving on and, and with same with international. Affairs, the Canada-Arizona Business Council is seeking support from Yuma County for the Canadian Snowbirds Act, which uh, establishes a non-immigrant visa for qualified Canadian citizens. The bill would allow Canadians that are 50 years old or older that rent or own property in the U.S. to stay an additional two months each year in the U.S. In the US. Currently, Canadians are permitted to stay for six months. It has received bipartisan support in both the House and the Senate, and it is co-sponsored by both Arizona Senators Kirsten Cinema and Mark Kelly. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. For us, it is. I, it, it, for us, it is. But it's also because it's still, they go home when it's still freezing. And if they stay more than five <laughs> months, 29 days, or whatever it is, they lose their insurance. So their health insurance. So this will be, uh, this would be really good for us. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Supervisor Frank Cressy, it is up to the board. If, if you need further information on this, I can always provide that. I'm, I'm still yeah. asking for more on it. Yes, uh, if, it, if it needs a board decision, actually board decision, do that. If not, then you know we can sign. I can sign, and they can sign. If that's if it doesn't require board action, I, I think we all support that, especially yeah. in communities like you. It helps our economy. Okay. So that is it for my regular. Uh, legislative update. I don't know, Mr. Chairman, if you have any questions or concerns. Um, ALO, mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, groundbreaking, uh, is that right? ALO? ALO. ALO. ALO in the groundbreaking. Is, it, uh, is the board aware that there's discussions about doing a groundbreaking in conjunction with the city of Yuma, the state? Mr. Chairman, I, I wouldn't know. I would have to uh, relay that to uh, the county administrator, but we know ALO is coming in this week on Friday. <laughs> And meeting with uh, county administrator and other staff members to uh, coordinate that event. All right. Well, then, I'll... and Mr. Chairman, it's in the works. And as soon as we have a date and a location, and but we're looking maybe the next six to eight weeks, some kind of kickoff event for the Yuma County Broadband Project. Well, we, we can ask that question during the uh, attends events, events attends, and to be attended. Yeah. Ian, are there already two two county supervisors attending that meeting on Friday? That meeting is just being set up as we speak. I was going to uh, extend an invitation to, to Chairman Reyes, and if, uh, if another board member wishes to attend, um, it looks like it'll be at 10.30 on Friday. So I'll leave it up to the board to decide who would like to attend that meeting. Just right through here at, at Yuma I County. I ran that committee, so I'm like, yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Sorry. So it's you and Tony? No. I'll send. Uh, are you available, Royce Porches? Friday, no. Okay, well then you two go. Okay. Okay. I don't. I I, I get too wound up on you, you know the county down. is the leader of this thing and they're gonna get wound up. Huh? And, you know I, they're I investing a lot of money and like you know I'll let tomorrow. you know. Yeah. If Darren wants to go, I'm up. just picking on him. I'm gonna be gone. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, I'm not. And I'm I am. Here. I've got pretty set ways and I don't want that to interfere with the process. I okay, just, I, just I got it. I'm Jennifer and then can do I mean Jennifer. <laughs> Jennifer. Jennifer. Hi Jennifer. My sister's name is Jennifer. Hello. I am not Jennifer. Jennifer. Can, attend, can attend that meeting. Jennifer here, you know, <laughs> refuses to go, but Jonathan will. <laughs> uh, uh, are you sure it's not a Monday? So, uh, not sure a Monday. That's why I kind of feel like usual. And we, we both haven't slept well. The chairman enough. is struggling to recover. <laughs> Continue. Oh, that, that's it. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Well, we Thank you. Uh, an additional item. Oh, you do? I do yeah. have to okay, put it? on there. Yeah. Well, I, it's actually an agenda item that you might want to read, and then I'll move on to the next person. I don't want to be called upon by that. Any attorney. Oh, 
Oh. All right, so talk to me <laughs> later. CSA. Okay. CSA? I thought you said you were coming in. Oh, the CSA summit. Right, oh, that's, summit. A, that's a, an additional item we have on the agenda. Um, so the 2022, as you know, County Supervisor Association of Arizona Annual Legislative Summit will take place in Tucson, October 5 through October 7. During the summit, the CSA will establish short and long-term legislative priorities as well as establish its lobbying strategy. Additionally, the CSA is offering county, counties the opportunity to submit policy proposals for consideration as future bills to be introduced in the 2023 state legislative session. The deadline for counties to submit the legislative policy proposals to the CSA is August 15. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, the intent of this agenda item is first and foremost to ask for the board direction regarding the county's legislative policy proposals for the upcoming session. We'll also inform you that the Yuma County staff, Yuma County staff is, is currently working with the CSA staff on a potential policy priority for you to consider in an upcoming Board of Supervisors meeting. Can right. I add something to that? Absolutely. Agenda? I want the, the poop bill to be put on there. Um, something about either the counties can, um, the counties can have the, the right to determine whether or not they want um, out of state human waste to be distributed on their farmland or their land or, or in their... Um, what it is is ADQ, ADQ is the ones that control it now. They need, we need to get something on the books to where the counties can control it because we're the ones that are getting the complaints and having to deal with it. And it, it's like, well, like I said, the-, the, the And we the, keep bringing down ADQ and then yeah, nothing happens, so. You have the, 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 the human waste that comes into the county, but we've got, pro I've got problems like in the foothills with rock quarry and dust and stuff, which is all controlled through ADQ. And we have no say so over it. Yet we're the ones that have to deal with it. So, so the idea is to bring some sort of legisl le legislative act that allows counties some participation in the process of approving some type of permit that, is go that are going to create environmental uh, complaints. Or allow us to go up to 98.5 or whatever it is in the state of California that the, has to be cleaned to, up to, the, the waste has to be cleaned up to 98.5 instead oh, yeah. of the 95 that we require here so that I think California state, can get rid of their own waste, sorry. In their own. Waste. In their own state. Yeah, yeah well, well, I mean, obviously so, that, that is, uh, that's you know, the but it's, the, it's not just the level of, you know, waste. It's just the fact that people here just feel powerless to stop anything from happening when California, you know, it sends everything that they don't like well, to, to but, the territory. But it's not California. Mm -hmm. Well, it's Arizona. So oh, that's what I'm saying. Well, that's I mean, why I want to raise the amount, yeah. raise the rate from 95 well, to 98. Send it to La Paz so or Mojave. They, they don't get a benefit from it. They're going to listen to Even during this meeting, Mr. Chairman, I had two complaints on flies. Uh huh. It's about flies. Well, anyway, look, I think I think it's I think we're taking this too far. Well, we want some sort of uh, legislative uh, verbiage that we can put in front of the CSA and get prepared because last time we had this economic development thing that we thought was gonna fly through and it didn't. So by now we need to understand the process so that we can have the best positions available. One of them is going to be this bill or this possible bill and then we'll pick up the other ones. Uh, we gotta get it ready by when? August 15. August 15? Yes. Okay, so we do have about a month and you know, that's one. Let's think about the other ones and bring them forward to Alejandro so we can and, and, I, and I say just let this keep it to the to the waste or whatever. I mean, we start buying it, and it, that's where it it goes south. South. Well, they won't they won't they won't pass it. No, well, it has but, to be narrow or it yeah. won't be passed. Well, yeah, the that's waste what happened. Thing. Yeah, waste and the fact that the problem I have Sorry. falls <laughs> within the PM10 area, which increases oh. that. So, yeah, but the PM10 is going to be—it's a federal thing. There's no way we're going to get out of that one. Yeah, but what's an EPA thing? Control. This is too much discussion about it. Bring forth the items. We'll discuss them as they are in the agenda and bring them forth. This is just not, you know, the time to discuss all the pros and cons. Yeah. Uh, make it as broad as possible, then we can limit, or make it two separate ones so that you know one doesn't impact the other. That's I mean, right. Okay? That would work. 
Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I will. I will work with development services. And uh, and I think that everybody here will make a commitment to be there or give somebody their proxy. Mm -hmm. So you, it's, it's there's plenty of time to plan, and it doesn't fall on a board of supervisors meeting date. It, this is like a Thursday, to, you know, like a Wednesday to Friday or something like that. Alejandro, when yeah, Mr. Chair and Alejandro, when you do some research, we went to the U of A and had a uh, all the little jars put at uh, Orange Grove and and right. those areas. And they found salmonella and E. coli, and those kids were kept inside during the the months where the flies were so bad. So um, that's part of our concern. All right. So, right. so I will work with development services to find out more details on this and uh, what has prevented us from doing it in the past. And I will come back to you with more information on it. Uh, I'm also working with uh, Public Works and CSA on a waste tire management oh, issue. Good. Uh, exploring the possibility of bringing that forward to you as well. See if right. it's feasible for us to decide to do that. I don't want to expand too much on anything you're presenting, but I would like to know the options of recycling that internally and using it on our own roads to, to bring down the dust. I mean, I know tires can be recycled into usable asphalt material that may be cheaper and buying it from someone that recycles and bring it in. But the cost of that's right. going up. Mr. Chair, I, I already, I, I went and visited all that and asked those questions, and it, uh, it costs more for us to buy the equipment to do it than it would be. Uh, everything's maybe like that. that. Okay. Everything's I like just, that, and know. I just want to make sure, look, if the, we've got some money now that we could use in one-time situations. This seems to be a prime one because we have so many roads that have, need some sort of stabilization, especially mm -hmm. with the PM10 issue. So even laying down recycled tire material into some of those roads improves the the the, the ability of it to handle traffic. So I, I just want you to research it, and, to, and it's not like we're making a decision on it. It just. Mr. Chairman, we've been having conversations with ADQ on this for a long, for a full year or more than that, oh, uh, and uh, the truth of the matter is, according to development services, is that no matter how many roads we pave, it's going to be hard for us to meet the number uh, that EPA is setting for us. Never, nonetheless, uh, we are working with ADQ to draft a state implementation plan right. that will come up with some measures from our side uh, to play along with EPA and, and you know do as much as we can in a cost-effective manner. All right. OK. OK. Got it. So anything else? That'll be it. That's All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. All right, uh, the next item is discussion post action regarding the adoption of 2023 legislative proposals to be submitted by, and this is what we're talking about already. Yeah. So we're yeah, done. Yeah, we've done that. Uh, okay, so we're moving on to event calendar and current events. Board members and county administrators will report on events attended to be attended on behalf of the county and may present a brief summary of current events and update the schedule for future board of supervisors meeting. As appropriate, no legal action will be taken. Um, what is it? it begin. Okay. Then yes. you begin. Um, I attended the uh, WACOG Regional Council on Aging. Um, I attended the Tafna Water Project Special Meeting. Um, I attended the Save the River Yuma Area Agriculture. Um, and, uh, and I attended YMPO Meeting. Uh, Assistance League Re Grand, uh, Re Grand Opening. I attended that. Um, Assistance League does so much for this community. Um, I attended the BNC Colonia meeting last night, and um, and that's that's Great. it. I was out of town for a while. So. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Jennifer, <laughs> your supervisor lying. Um, he can beat me on this week, huh? Not. Not really. Oh. Not really. He was out of town. No. Uh, I had a couple of conversations with um, a few of our congressmen uh, regarding water. Uh, and then visited with uh, several Yuma area ag uh, producers uh, regarding the challenges that they are confronting if we go to tier two and tier three. Mm -hmm. um, it looks as if uh, many of the farmers on the Mesa will be following land as well as in the Imperial, I'm sorry, in the well, Mohawk district. Um, and um, some in the Gila Valley, depending upon uh, the next couple of months. Many of them have used, because of the drought, over 50% in the first four months. 
Um, and then I had the opportunity to partic participate in a roundtable discussion with uh, the Arizona Homeland Security, uh, Tim Romer in Phoenix uh, last week, uh, talking about some of the border challenges, uh, the smuggling, not just the human smuggling, but also narcotics and the um, uh, any type of uh, manufactured good uh, coming across the border as um, a counterfeit. Mm. Okay. Any, oh, there you go. Supervisor Simmons. Uh, attended the TAC water meeting, uh, special meeting with the VOS. Uh, attended a Mohawk Valley school groundbreaking. Uh, they got $5 million through the school's facilities fund for upgrades uh, to the school down there, which was mm -hmm. desperately, desperately in need of. Mm -hmm. uh, had a meeting with the Walton Town Manager. Also attended the water meeting at Booth Machinery. Uh, had PSPRS court mill meeting, uh, election advisory board meeting, and had a Zoom meeting with the president of Elliott Homes and other individuals, the mayor, uh, other county people, reference to the problem of uh, uh, been getting suspicious fires, uh, most of them in the city, some out in the foothills area. So we're trying to put together a group to address that. And I just want to let everybody know if you see anything, please call, report it. And if you know anything about all these suspicious fires, and I want to call them arson fires because that's what they are, um, around not just the county but the city call 78 crime uh, like I said it's anonymous and they do have a reward out for anything leading to the arrest of these individuals that are setting these fires uh, and we need to stop it we had one just last week all right uh, uh, we also attended the Tegna meeting uh, water meeting uh, the YMPO and uh, the elections committee. All right. I, uh, I attended the executive uh, meeting of the Western Arizona Council of Governments and the Vision Group meeting in San Luis and the 4th of July event in San Luis, Arizona, which was, <laughs> it was a, a big crowd. Let's just say that they thought it was over 15,000 people, and I believe it, looking out of that crowd. And they, they had a great event. Uh, oh, the good. concert afterwards was great. Um, and they, they actually made the announcement of the $33 million improvement to Cesar Chavez. Um, and, um, and that's basically a lot of the events I attended. Now, what I want to do is deal with the special meeting that we need to have for the um, candidates. candidates. How about the 11th? Does anybody have a problem with Monday the 11th, even if we start at 10 or something like that, at 9? I'm going to be out of town. I'll, I'll let you know. I'll be out of town. Well, then it just can't happen. Is there any day during that week? Uh, well, no. no. I'll be out of town after the 12th. Uh, I'm going to be out of town the rest of the month. I'm out of town that day, too. So who's, who's here the 18th? I'll be here the 18th. Uh, hold on. I'll call in, but I'll be out. I'll be here the 18th. I'll be, I'll be in my car coming back. Um, it's going to be a tough one to make. Um, what about Friday the 15th? Is anybody home? I'll be I'll gone. Go See, that's the problem with July. What about Friday the 8th? It is? This, this Friday. The 18th is a regular meeting. The 18th is a regular meeting, yes. What about Friday the 8th of this month? Just this Friday? Are, is anybody here? Is everybody here on the Friday? I'm leaving Friday morning. He's leaving Friday morning. 10.30, right? Yes, we have a 10.30, but we could do it afterwards or I before. We do have a 10.30. We have an admin staff meeting, which we could... We could move if we had to at nine. Well, I can do this at nine, but I can't do it later. Right. If we do a meeting Friday, we'll have to post it tomorrow. Yeah, and it'd be at nine. I, you I'm, know. I'm, Are you? I'm, a, I'm, I'm not you're out of town. Yeah. You'll be working. Mm. Well, then it's the 18th. Ooh, baby. Yeah, I'm it's on the 12th to the 17th. Okay. Yeah. I mean, look, there is no particular reason why this doesn't take the time that it needs. It just, uh, this is a bad month to plan for five people to be together. Maybe this is going to be enough. That, but you see, not all of us have to go through the process, but 
you know, what would be nice is to come up with a list of questions we're going to ask and then figure out when, you know, sort of survey when, when can, can three of us or more of us can be, can get together. It could be, it could be the week of the, maybe the 11 to the 8 to the 15, where I may be able to zoom in or something and we could do this conversations. I mean, this is sort of like an interview process. Um, I mean, the problem with this building is that it's not set up to hold the Zoom call meeting while the meeting is going on. It would have to be in our offices upstairs mm -hmm. or, or, you know, someplace oh, else. Upstairs, but I would say yeah. that if we're going to interview people and we're going to do it openly, we can't just simply do it upstairs or in a Zoom call. It had to be here. We could provide, uh, Mr. Chairman, we could provide a monitor in this room for the public to observe the meeting if, if the board members are upstairs in the meeting room. Can that be done? We've done it before for the legislative meetings that you've had, yes. All right, well, let's see if we can set something up for next week. And, you know, next week to me means the week of the 11th through the 15th and see what where we're all at or where we can. Uh, 11th seems to be out. I'd be out the 12th to the 17th. I was barely going to try to make it the 18th back. Uh, and so, so that leaves us very little time between now. It's a Wednesday today. I mean, this is not like we have the rest of the week. We could do this Friday morning for some of them if you can make it here. I could be here at 9, for example, if you needed me, uh, if you wanted me to participate, and whomever can make it. I know saying 8 o'clock is even worse, but could we do it at 8? We can. We can. Yeah. On Friday at 8 and, and go from 8 to 10 or 8 to 10.30? Yeah, right, or... we could do it. We can, we, look, we don't need to schedule a lot of time. You, we have um, to come up with three or four questions. Archie, um, could you do Friday it virtually morning. on the um, on Friday on this, at eight o'clock. This right at eight. I think so. At eight, I can. I, I can call in. Okay. Okay. Right. At eight. Okay. I'd okay. like to. I'd like to get all of this set up before. Before next week, the week after. Yeah. The week after is yeah. going to be tough. I can call in. <laughs> so just I'm going to be in San Antonio. Can you call in on the on this Friday? We're talking about this Friday, July eighth at eight a.m. Yeah. Is that... Can you call in, Darren? Yeah, I can call. Okay. In. All right. Can we do that? Yeah, you post it tomorrow. It's 24 hours. Okay. You have to post it tonight. Mm -hmm. All right. Is there enough time for people who... Uh, well, who that's, 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 their, their, that's their thing. That's right. really, I could just ask who will be calling in or who will be appearing by Zoom. Any... Personally. I'll call. If One phone Friday, call. I'll call. Two yeah. phone calls. Can we accommodate that in this room? No. Unless you're really close on Friday morning. No. Perhaps Aldrich might be a more tech-friendly solution. So we'll, we'll let the board know. All right, uh, just post it and push the place because we need to post the place. And if it's outreach, it's not a problem for me. It's actually closer. If you would, too, just send out the phone number we need to call in on. Yeah. Set it up on outreach. I think they're better set up. This is a pretty bad setup. Yeah. And let everybody know that we'll be interviewing Friday. And please, we'll work on the questions that we can legally ask. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, just, just to clarify, we'll assist Ian with questions Thank from you. our office if he needs it. Also, if individual uh, Supervisors have a question they like or two that they'd like to ask. I don't. I mean, you're elected. You can ask what you'd like. Um, I would just recommend you ask each candidate the same question. Okay. All right. Okay. Got it. Anything else? I mean, not for me. From you. You're Ian. Yeah. Come on. We'll assist to make sure we're up to co we're up to speed on what's needed for open meeting law. We'll assist. Right. Okay. No, it's Thank fine. you. Are you asking for my event summary, Mr. Yeah, Chairman? Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, of course, the uh, special session in TACNA. Welcome a dozen new employees at the new higher orientation. Attended the Yuma County Chamber of Commerce meeting. Attended two meetings with Arizona at Work. Participated in a meeting of the Yuma County Employee Benefit Trust. Appeared on the Today in Yuma radio show with <laughs> hosts Jennifer Blackwell and Teresa yeah. Straub. Attended a YSIPTA meeting, board meeting. Attended a meeting of the Yuma County COVID Wastewater Monitoring Steering Committee. Oof. Met with Lucy, Lucy Rodriguez of Senator Kelly's office. She's actually going to be leaving her role this Friday to take a new job in the agriculture industry. Participated in a meeting with ASIP, that's the Arizona County's insurance pool, related to cybersecurity coverage. Oh, that yeah. Coverage is going down while the cost is going up. Attended an election advisories committee meeting and also was at the 4th of July celebration in San Luis, which was terrific and, and oh, thousands was it? and thousands. Oh, that's so good. Uh, as Supervisor Simmons mentioned, I'll be meeting, uh, well, I'll be meeting with interim city manager uh, over at Yuma to discuss the suspicious fires tomorrow. Um, and we hope to get good news to, to, let's see, tomorrow is the 7th regarding the Arizona broadband 
development grant. We've applied for ten million, and uh, we'll find out tomorrow if we if we get it and how much. So that's it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Um, uh, the question that was asked just before the end of this from Supervisor uh, Porches is whether there was anything that needed to be signed, the voting credentials for the National Association of Counties meeting on July something. They're going. For, for the, for, yeah, I, I think uh, I'm, I'll be carrying four proxies with that, uh, and then going, but uh, do we need anything to share? Or? These are votes. Uh -huh. Letters. And do we need to sign the yes, proxy? We'll find out. Yeah. Let me know. We'll, we'll, we'll we'll find out. Okay. Thank you for bringing that up. That's it, guys. Uh, everybody, thank you very much. You've been patient, extremely patient. Thank you for just holding on and you know going through the process with us. We we'll hope to some of you. We hope to see you next Friday, I guess, at 8 a.m. If you're here, and if not, then we'll see you at the next this Friday. This Friday. Well, next Friday is this Friday, right? <laughs> I mean, we don't have another next Friday, do we? Okay, just, all right. Just don't use that. Just, don't just use that wanted, analogy to, on, just wanted on the to have the last. <laughs> just wanted to have the last word in. <laughs> so thank you very much. Wednesdays are bad days for him.